shake up the order a little bit and turn next to the uh, Pulitzer winning Scott Simon. Here he is. Um, <laughs> Scott joined uh, NPR back in 1977. He has reported from all 50 states, six continents, covered presidential campaigns in eight wars, which I think is plenty. Please welcome Scott Simon, everybody. <laughs> You want me to keep this facing this way? Sure. You have no idea what you're about to miss. <laughs> uh, really, should I? Well, I guess I can do that. Look, I got a call uh, the other day from the fine people who run this conference asking what uh, images I might want to include for my PowerPoint presentation. Now, um, I have this radio program. Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I do television pieces, uh, done stuff out of Maryland, public television. In fact, I write novels, essays. The more I thought about it, the more I thought I have arguably lived my life in such a way as to never have to prepare a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and uh, it also struck me that that might even be a little bit at odds with a lot of what I have to say. So uh, feel free to lie back, uh, close your eyes, uh, listen, uh, as if it were Saturday morning. That's how a lot of people know me anyway. I believe in stories, professionally and personally. I believe that stories are as basic to being a human being as is love, and maybe for the same reason. Stories assure us that life is not just bare survival. That phrase, once upon a time, it tells us we can leave footsteps, fingerprints, and memories. Stories make us want to turn the page, start over tomorrow, take the next breath. Shakespeare, the Bible, a bunch of stories. Kings and queens, serfs and slaves, saints and witches, mysteries, intrigues, plots, jokes, despair, fates, and exultation. Will Romeo and Juliet ever get together? Will Moses lead his people to the promised land? Was Macbeth possessed by genius or insanity? Was Abraham or Moses? Does Mercutio make you laugh? Does Job, when he says to a friend, try silence, for you it will be wisdom? <laughs> the first stand-up comedian, even when he was in a fish. Uh, before the accounts of the lives of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Moses, Deborah, or Solomon became parables, they were stories. They drip with blood, tests, doubts, loves, rejections, certitudes, and surprises. What's on the other side of the mountain? How do we get through this fire, this flood? Does she love me? Does he even know I'm alive? Who laid down with whom and begat whom? What's the right thing to do? Now think of certifiably great paintings. Why do the Mona Lisa, uh, Rembrandt's The Night Watch, or almost anything by Toulouse-Lautrec fascinate and endure? It's because they invite us into a story. What makes that lady smile the way she does? Now, I tell stories to our daughters at night. Now, we also read stories. We let them watch stories on television and the web. But there is something that our daughters enjoy about stories in person and on demand. Uh, right now, those stories feature a repertory of characters around a mischievous little boy named Ralph and his goody two-shoes uh, sister, Patty. They have a friend named Duncan the Dolphin who lives in Lake Michigan. Uh, there's Beulah, a good witch, who takes them and rides on her broom around skyscrapers and the Eiffel Tower. There's Scully, a skeleton, who sleeps in Patty and Ralph's closet, for whom they, they dress up in their father's old clothes and they bring him to school. Uh, nothing like show and tell or bringing into science class a friendly skeleton to show you that the knee bone really is connected to the shin bone. Uh, there's also Ethel Mermaid, my favorite character. <laughs> Lives in Lake Michigan, but she does toddle up on shore to say, you'll be swell, you'll be great. <laughs> now, Ralph once decided he was going to pour every box of lime jello he could find into the Chicago River. And Patty said, Ralph, you cannot turn the river into jello. I am so embarrassed. But you know what? Everybody in town enjoyed bouncing on the springy lime jello. Now, my wife says that she sometimes overhears, let me just adjust this. I knew that singing would have some kind of uh, 
dark effect on that. My wife says she sometimes overhears our six-year-old daughter at least tell her friends these stories in the schoolyard, and if some little boy or girl expresses some skepticism about a dancing skeleton or a lake turned into jello, Elise says, for real, that's for real. <laughs> stories are real forces in our lives, even if they're not for real. Now, something's been happening to my Patty and Ralph stories over the past couple of months. Elise has started making suggestions. If I begin, it was about this time at night, she'll say, make it morning. If I say it was winter, she'll say, uh, make it summer. She enjoys being my co-conspirator. Now remember, children teach us by making us look at something afresh. So our daughters remind me stories are wild animals. You may think you give them birth, but they become their own creation. They don't stick to the script. They feed off things they find in the underbrush. Stories play and mate with abandon. They move from your mind into other minds and they grow into creatures that you never imagined. Now, I report real life stories. I write novels that tell stories. I don't know how many times I've encountered people who say in the nicest way, you know, your story meant so much to me because it showed me. And then they finish that sentence in a way I never would. With some idea that not only is nothing that I ever thought I meant, but in fact collides directly with something I thought I'd said pretty clearly. <laughs> but you know, they're not wrong. Because stories are art, not instruction. Stories grow and change with the audience. An instruction manual can tell you how to put together a crib, though I don't mind telling you the one my wife and I put together has a couple of pieces left over. We can't figure out what to do with. Uh, I noticed some heads nodding here. We might all put all those pieces together and see what we can do with them someday. But you take the basic element of that crib and put them into a story. They can become a bridge, a skyscraper, a city, a road. Just depends on how you arrange your building blocks, and those building blocks are words. Sir Tom Stoppard says, words are innocent, neutral precise, standing for this, describing that, meeting the other, so that if you look after them, you can build bridges across incomprehension and chaos. He says, I don't think writers are sacred. Words are. They deserve respect. If you get the right ones in the right order, you can nudge the world a little, or make a poem which children will speak for you when you're dead. Now, words are not only how we speak or write, they become how we think. It's how we begin to connect the thigh bone to the shin bone. Now, not so many years long ago, many people thought we'd be growing up in a progressively non-linear world. We would be freed from the surly bonds of Gutenberg, Shakespeare, and Cervantes. Images would become the sum total of information. Thoughts would flare, flicker, and connect like amoebas, not roll heavily on treads and tracks freighted down with words. Stories would be replaced by sensation narratives by bites. Today, with the advantage of, what, 10 years hindsight? We can see that as so often happens with history, nothing turned out the way anyone expected it to. At this moment, and maybe it's only a moment, words and stories have taken wing. People all over the world dispatch images from the streets of Tehran or Rangoon that can be opened by suburban 12-year-olds from Baltimore to Beijing to Belize. But words and stories sink in and reach out. Netta, the young woman in Tehran, became an emblem because we saw that image and then we inferred a story about a young innocent girl killed by agents of a state without conscience and a system with no recourse. It was an image that at that point in events a few months ago had been fleshed out by thousands of stories and millions of words sent from the palms of people whose fingers were connected to conscience. Now newspapers and books printed in text and hard paper may have a limited shelf life. But words blinking on screens, uttered by voices, words seeping into minds, that's ascending. In this moment, the technology of instantaneous expression has reminded us of both the romance and utility and language of words and stories. Nowadays, people just don't want or expect to merely consume and enjoy stories. They want to write their own. They want to share them with others. They expect to share them with others. An unshared story is a story that sits like a stone on the heart. 
Most memorable story ever covered. Actually, I have an answer for that. Siege of Sarajevo in the 1990s. You'd come in as a reporter, and you'd land in a, in a British-German military aircraft, you'd come down through artillery fire, you'd get loaded into a, a French Foreign Legion armored personnel carrier. Uh, a stubby, smelly, windowless crate that I'd call ugly, except it shielded you from sniper fire. You could hear the, the pinging against the walls like steel gnats trying to break in. And the Egyptian soldiers inside would sing, we all live in the yellow submarine. <laughs> Yellow submarine. Yeah, I went through a, a checkpoint that was burrowed between sandbags. As it was being patted down, I heard a young voice calling out in very slangy American English. Hi, my name is Arena. What's yours? I saw this dark-haired teenage girl with short, chopped hair wearing an old Soviet army jacket. I said, uh, Scott, where are you from? I said, Chicago. Oh, I love Chicago. Michael Jordan, Playboy, Pizza Blues, Jazz, Scotty Pippen. I love Chicago Bulls. She had a friend next to her, a young blonde woman. She said, can we visit you sometime? Me and my friend Amala, here we go out during the day to look for food and bring back water to everybody in our building. Can we visit you? I said, sure, why not? We're staying. She said, I know where you are staying, Scott. There's only one place to stay in town, the hotel with no windows. You don't think there's a Ritz here, do you? <laughs> so the soldier snapped open my briefcase, and I saw um, a small box of British Airways business class chocolates on top. I tossed them over to Arena and Amla. A gesture later made me cringe, an American doling out chocolates. Next day, Arena and Amla showed up at our hotel. They had vaulted through sniper fire and were smiling. Arena was holding three flowers for us. Who knows where she got them? As I learned, you could never give her anything without her giving something back. You know, I, I said, you know, you shouldn't have done something so dangerous just to see us. She said, there's a ward here, Scott. If we wait until things aren't so dangerous, we'd never do anything. During the day, Sarajevo belonged to teenage girls. Teenage boys were in the army. Parents were cooped up by artillery fire. And as we parents learn, you can't coop up teenage girls. They were the ones who took to the streets, dodged sniper fire, scrounged for food, braved cold and bombs to stand in water lines. That's how we got to know the city, with Arena and Amala. Irena was turning 16 that week, and we did a story about a girl turning sweet 16 in a precinct of hell. Two girls smoking, laughing, drinking, running for their lives. Irena told us how she and her family had been chased from their neighborhood by Serb, Serb paramilitaries, how they had to eat grass and leaves, burn chairs, a leg and an arm at a time to have heat, how the one time that she and her mother had permitted themselves to cry was when their family parrot had stopped eating. You can't tell a parrot, all the seed is gone. I guess you have to get used to grass. If I only had to take the parrot up to the top of a building and let him go during a, a lull in the sniper fire, hoping that he'd fly to the other side of the city, find another family, warmth, and food. Arena kidded her mother about crying. She said, you love that damn bird more than you love me. Her mother said, it's close, that's for sure. <laughs> You know, it wasn't until weeks after our stories had aired that Arena's mother told me she and her daughter had been raped when they'd been turned out of their neighborhood. In Chicago or London, it would be such a crisis, she said. You'd go for therapy, you'd go for treatment. But here, it's happened to so many. Just not a story. The siege of Sarajevo lasted four years. I kept going back. There was no school during that time, so Rena and Amala went to work for us as fixers. We laughed a lot together, we cried together, we got shot at together. Our stories became intertwined. I don't mind saying we, we filled spaces in each other's hearts. About 10 years later, I wrote my novel, Pretty Birds, and it's about two teenage girls during the siege of Sarajevo. It's not Arena Anomala, but I named the principal characters Arena Anomala in tribute. But the parrot that is the title character, based on the one that Arena and her mother let go from the top of the roof. I could at least make sure that in literature, if not life, the bird is found. Now, Pretty Birds, uh, the novel is in development, as they say on the other coast. Uh, Arena knows that her story has important, become important to really many people around the world. 
And we also know that our lives, our stories, are tied for life. I would say that that bond is closer than words can express, except I've written and spoken quite a few thousand words to try and express it. Small box of chocolates just tossed over some sandbags, stories sent up into the air. As the great Norman Corwin once wrote, here is a thought to fasten the throat. Who knows who may be listening and where? My stepfather, Ralph, yes, the inspiration for Ralph and the stories, was a merry and remarkable man, a former minor league second baseman who broke his nose on a double play ball wound up opening the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. He used to huff about that phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. He'd say, you know what you can do with a thousand words? And rather in the way that my daughters and I now trade and try out stories with each other, my stepfather and I spread out a napkin on a restaurant table once, and we came up with this. One picture is worth a thousand words. You give me a thousand words. I'll give you the Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm, the Hippocratic Oath, a sonnet by Shakespeare, the preamble to the Constitution, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the last graphs of Martin Luther King's speech to the March on Washington, and the final entry of Anne Frank's diary. And I wouldn't trade you for any picture on earth. Thank you. <laughs>